wiener 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 I got home from Whole Foods shut the door in it's windy too and then what happened the door slammed shut and flapped my dick man it hurt man brain in it wiener I closed the door on my wiener thing and now it's gonna bleed wiener wiener and my balls burst too wiener wiener shut the door on my wang and bainer wiener 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 welcome to the that thing with James. I'm your host, James. And with me is Emily. Thanks for tuning in. Hello. And for some of you, I see you've got some new folks around. Welcome to the show. Quick description. This is, I guess, a variety show. That is, you never know what you're going to get. That is because I never know what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> There's no any specific niche or subject. We just explore all sorts of different stuff and different people. We explore our bodies, our minds, our... I can't think of a good third one. You're supposed to have stuff in threes, but I didn't have it. Yeah. Environment and surroundings. You explore your surroundings. Your um, inner circles and your outer circles. You pick your friends. Yep. Pick your friend's nose, which you can do. If your friend is good enough, you can pick their nose. I don't know if I'd be picking any of my friends' noses, but maybe. You could. You can always pick a friend's nose. It's true. Uh, so, quick thanks to uh, Jason and Brian, my guests from last week, some of my best friends. Thank you guys for coming on to the show. That was pretty fun. I had a really good time doing that. And quick note, um, next week there will be a gap in in this show i'm gonna skip recording next week because we have a friend's wedding to attend next weekend and um we've only got so much time in the week yeah. you only got so much time if you want to help us get more time though and also um get access to a once weekly bonus episode plus access to all the other bonus episodes I've recorded and released, uh, become a patron at patreon.com slash that thing with James. Uh, subscription started only five bucks a month. So one, you get to support an independent entertainer. And uh, also this show can, you know, it keeps you company. Sure. And show your appreciation for just five bucks for an entire month. And, and you get stuff back. One, you get access because we record a new bonus episode every week. Well, except for next weekend. But every other week we record bonus episodes. Um, and you can also get shouts out in text. A verbal shout out. I can shout you out on the show. Hell, you could even get a handwritten thank you note from me. So become a patron if you haven't already at patreon.com slash that thing with James. You can find me on social media. My handle is at James J. Asher. And you can also email me with business inquiries um, if you have an idea for a subject or a story for me to cover on the show. Or if you like are in need of advice or something, I can give you advice. Email me at thatthingwithjames at gmail.com. And also you can become a member of my of a Reddit community at r slash thatthingwithjames. Um and that's all the business for there for 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 this episode. Um, so I've been watching this show called Neon Genesis Evangelion. Have you ever heard of it? I mean, yes, I've heard people talk about it, but I've never watched it before. Well, um, can you recall any specific details or or like where or who you heard people talking about this? Like it tends to be people that watch anime. Like coworkers and stuff. I've heard them talk about it, but like it's just been, I've heard of it before. And it's been like years you've yeah. known about it? Yes. I never watched it until today. Yeah. And oh, until today. Yeah. I'd never watched that before. Yeah. I just started watching it um, this week. 
And uh, and this morning we watched like a handful of episodes. Yeah. Um, but I've known about it for years because it's one of those things where it's like, it's one of those iconic things that you have to watch. Mm-hmm. Sort of like, I mean, the show's nothing like Breaking Bad, but it's like Breaking Bad in that you just need to watch it. Yeah. Especially if you're into animation, adult animation or anything like that. And um, I got to say, the show just keeps getting better for me. Yeah. It's really tripped out. Yeah, it definitely was interesting. I don't know if I'm a fan yet, but it's fine. What do you find interesting about it? Just the concept, like the weird creatures that keep coming down, the angels, as they call them. Yeah, they call them angels. Mm -hmm. That's so bizarre. Which ties into that other show that we tried to watch and turned off. Oh, Midnight Mass. Mm -hmm. Oh, tell me about that. I mean, it was really boring, in my opinion. Like, I just didn't really like it, and it had so much potential to be good. Mm -hmm. And then it just seems like they shit the bed. So a little bit of background here. Um, Midnight Mass is currently a new um, Netflix uh, limited series, a.k.a. miniseries. And it is based on two separate Stephen King stories. And, um, well, I don't know if I want to... I don't know if I can give too much yeah, away. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I, will, I won't give anything away. But I, what I will say is directors, directors, especially in the 2000s. Jesus, you know, our neighbors waited until we started recording to start having a screaming fight. So sorry if you hear anything in the background. Yeah. Um. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Just screaming bloody murder. Um, Mad at somebody. Yeah, she is. She's always mad at somebody Mm -hmm. or something and screaming about it. (sighs) Okay. Um, In the 2000s, it's just there's so many boring fucking directors. Yeah. So boring. Last night, we had like the worst rash of just boring directors, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And um, I think for Midnight Mass, at least... And I don't think I'm giving any way too much. I can say it's about vampires. Or a vampire-like creature, yeah. Who knows? Let's just say vampires. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even finish the series yet. I still might go in and force myself to finish it. I probably will finish it, too. Just because I want it to be good. Yeah. I want it to be good. I have high hopes for it, honestly. But it's just like, so far, it's just been dragging for me. And I think we're like over halfway into the series. I mean, I think so, but I don't know. We watched like five or six episodes. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, we did. Um, and it's one of those shows, like so many other shows, um, where it's just n- not just boring, but irritatingly melodramatic. Yeah. Irritatingly melodramatic. And frankly, I think, I I don't know if it's the actors to blame or if it's the director or producers or all of the above. All of the parties, yeah. Probably all of the above. Probably all of them. Um, it's good that you as an actor can uh, tap into your emotions and emote, but... Just emoting is not acting. Yeah. It's and, and the thing about it, like for me that kept losing my attention was that it was just really inconsistent. Like it wanted to go one way and then it kept like pacing itself to not go that way. Mm-hmm. And things could have been shortened. It could have been like a little bit less time being spent on it if they would have just gone in and gone for a more direct route. So you're saying the story wanted to speed up mm-hmm. and wanted things to start going sideways, but it wouldn't allow it. Yeah. And th- why they're trying to set up the characters for us, but it's just like, it's not working for me, but they already set up the characters. Yeah. I mean, that's something you do in the first episode or two. Yeah. Maybe three. Okay. Quick tip. Quick writing tip. Well, uh, and I know, James, how many television scripts have, have you written and ha- and sold? Zero. But as an avid and lifelong enjoyer of entertainment of all sorts, for TV show, especially, especially a miniseries, 
By the third episode, you need to have a hint, at least a big hint of what the secret is. Mm -hmm. What's the secret in the story? And also have things ramping up by the third episode. And so many series refuse to do that. One example we just finished was Nine Perfect Strangers. Yeah. Ended up, I, I thought it was a cool show. It's just they really could have cut out probably three episodes worth of needless drama that didn't really do anything to drive the plot forward or um, add any more essential information about the characters. You know what it felt like? You know when you take a picture of a baby and you have to shake something to get its attention yes. in order to do a task? That's how it felt. Uh, uh, can you mind expanding on that? So imagine like you're watching that show. You're watching Nine Perfect Strangers in this example. And they're like, the drama seemed to be added to keep your attention when they had other elements that would have kept my attention more. The drama was added to keep your attention? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like something that can satiate the masses. I don't know that the, but the thing is the drama didn't keep my attention. The drama was annoying. Yeah. It was the other new information uh, that would get my attention. Yeah. And that's what is happening thus far with nine, or, or uh, it happened with nine perfect strangers, at least until like the last few episodes. Yeah. Um, this is what Midnight Mass is doing where there will be like some new information, some new reveal or something, mm -hmm. um, something that creates drama is created by uh, someone not getting what they want yeah. and how they deal with the obstacle. Right. Yeah. That's drama. Drama is not necessarily just emoting and talking about your past and talking about your feelings for a 10 minute weepy v lyrically um rich a little too rich lyrically a uh, 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 monologue it's cool that you can tap into your emotions and cry on demand and and picture these events these traumatizing events that happened in your past that's cool those are acting exercises, sort of like how lifting weights, you you push yourself so you can condition yourself to go further. Yeah. But the thing with exercising and lifting weights is possibly the goal is to just make you more powerful in general while you're doing everything else, right? Yes. And so an acting exercise to really dig and dig and dig deep into your um, – uh, uh, inner, um, your, your mind's eye and your sense memory and all this stuff. Um, the show itself shouldn't be, um, it, it should not be an acting class. I, 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 as I said that I'm already thinking like, well, there are a lot of shows that are sort of like a class on acting yeah. like breaking bad. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? The plays Walter. Walter Wright. Yeah, I, I always forget the actor's name. Cranz Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. He, I'm surprised I could remember that name. Watching him, especially in Breaking Bad, is an acting class for sure. But the thing is, um, he, he's he, I say he's really good because he's not one that will become overly weepy and stuff. Yeah. You think about when people talk about traumatic events and, and stuff they're having trouble dealing with their own, in their own lives. They don't just stop and pause for 10 seconds and yeah. cry and fully picture everything right there in the moment. No, that's an acting exercise you do on your on your own when you're learning the lines so you can get a better grasp on this character and who their uh, what their memories look and smell and feel like. You do that to get into the character. But once you're into the character, you just be the character. Yeah. You know, you want to really visualize and experience those things just so that they're already part of you. Yeah. You're not necessarily discovering it and, you know, savoring every single millisecond of it again. Because when people tell you stuff about their lives, it's usually kind of just 
details. It's just yeah. matter of fact. You know? Yeah. My dog died. Sure. I can remember him uh, when I would be asleep on the bed or trying to go to sleep. He would just like crawl up right on my face and just lick and lick and lick. He wouldn't stop licking me. He had this nervous thing where it was like a puppy sucking his, uh, its thumb, like a, like a baby sucking yeah. its thumb. He would lick his front paws to oh, try to, anxiety thing, to yeah. self-soothe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, but the thing is, I would just hear this like lapping, you know, as I'm trying to go to sleep. And would then not help me sleep. And I would try to like pet him to get him to like calm down. And so then when I pet him, he's like, oh, you're awake here. I'm going to kiss you. And would just try to kiss me in the mouth, like Ew. between the teeth. A little, this is a toy poodle, or well, was a toy poodle. Um, and then he would also just sort of like uh, curl up, because I sleep on my side. He would curl up um, in the crook between my bent knees and kind of snuggle up to my butt because yeah. it's warm there. And then we would fall asleep. And I inevitably would always wake up before him. Yeah. And he'd get up and look all weird and crazy and shit. Yeah. So that's different than saying, I can remember Taz. <sighs> he died. I can remember him. White. Fur like a little sheep. <sighs> he would lick my face. <laughs> you see the difference? Yeah. It's one's how... aping and then the other one's not. Aping? Mm -hmm. What is aping? I've never really figured out what that it's means. It's mimicking, essentially, like it's human what? mimicking. Oh, mimicking. Mm -hmm. Essentially, another human's actions or like. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Um, so it's kind of like the actor. Possibly, it's the actor, or maybe it's the director directing them to do this. When the actor may be like, I guess if this is what you want, yeah. It's what beginner actors do when they read a script and it says someone's holding back tears or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. It's, oh, it's a trap I used to fall in a lot. And it, it was hard to break. It was, oh, I'm supposed to cry here. Yeah. And you try and emote so hard to get yourself to cry in that moment. Because I guess I'm supposed to cry there because that's how it's supposed to be because that's the right way to do it. Yeah. Whereas more mature actors figure out um, the right way. There is no right way. Yeah. And there's no necessarily wrong way. There's good. There's well done or poorly done. But there's no right or wrong way. Yeah. You know? And don't try to emote it. You're just telling information and doing a task that can be achieved in the moment like try to gain someone's sympathy yeah and and attach some kind of physical thing to that by gain their sympathy by say petting them you know yeah because in your mind you may not be physically petting someone but sort of your intention is petting yeah but again that's something you do when you're learning your lines you're writing that in a script to help you just sort of wrap your mind around What's the objective from beat to the next beat to the yeah. next beat? And then when it comes time to actually do the work, just forget about all that shit and just be, uh, be a real person, have a real conversation and don't try to be someone else. Oh, I'm supposed to be Spider-Man. You can't be Spider-Man. You're, you're just Emily. Yeah. So just be Emily who happens to have a different name, maybe um, behaves in a different way. That's something you'd work on. Yeah. How you carry yourself, maybe reactions. like, But that's a lot of that stuff is informed by the script if it's written well. Yeah. Does any of this make sense, what I'm saying? Yes. And so many shows, either it's the director or the actors, or, or maybe the director's telling the actors to ape and milk it and be melodramatic. Yeah. Maybe the suits are telling the directors this isn't dramatic enough. Yeah, make them more gush. Make them more sad. Cause suits don't are not creative. Yeah. Um. So every episode is just a soap opera, and then at the very end, something interesting will actually happen. Yeah. 
And while the soap opera is happening, yeah, it's wasting so much time just getting something out. Yeah, you can talk about um, how you feel weird about death. Okay. Yeah. All right. And, and what does that have to do with the plot, too? That, that's, exactly. like, a big thing. It's, like, if the drama that's happening isn't actually a part of, like, the plot, I don't know why it exists. Right. And it's, like, oh, we're making more dynamic, I think they're trying to make it characters. more human. Right. Which, it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Like, they're trying... Yes, you should make dynamic, round characters, but... Again, yeah, do it in such a way that every every sentence, every paragraph, every line is driving the plot forward to whatever fucking resolution is going to happen, right? Yeah. Um, instead of just saying, okay, let's throw everything out and just show how this person feels upset and also show off how great this actor is. Oh, my God. Yeah. They can cry on demand. <laughs> Um, so I told you last night when we were watching it and it was after the particularly weepy scene, um, I said, if you're going to do something like this, like you could make a vampire story that's actually a soap opera, or you could make a soap opera that's actually a vampire story. Yeah. And I said they went for the former for that show. Because the the supernatural part is just sort of like a second. Uh, it, it's like it's there, but it's not like at the forefront of my mind when I'm watching it. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. There's like this weird creature that lives out there that's eating cats. It's yeah. It's like they wanted to make a soap opera, but they wanted it to like you know have a little hook. So it's like, let's say there's a supernatural thing. Yeah. Like we never talk about it, but I mean it's there, so. You know, although that's not really what the story is about. It's really about crying. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's our sort of shared complaint with a lot, a lot of TV shows. It's just so much wasted time. Soap operas. There's so many goddamn soap operas. Yes, sir. Talking about you, Haunted, Haunted Hill House. Oh, God, that show could have been so good. I didn't even watch the second season because I had zero interest. See, I forgot there was a second season. Yeah, I just second season. wanted to forget about it. Isn't the one show that we just heard watching, is Midnight Mass the one that was also same, produced by Han and T- Same. Mm. Oh, my God, yes. So that makes total mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. It's just a fucking soap opera. Yeah, what, it seems like that's where he started and it's like where he flourishes. Where When it could instead be way cooler. Yeah. I would say poor choice on the director. Yeah. Although he's the one that wrote it. Oh, still. Mike Flanagan. Like that one movie or TV show that we watched, Brand New Cherry or whatever. It's like that where it's like. Cherry flavor. It's like just get rid of that person and hire someone else to do it then. Yeah. You still got money from it. That show could have done without like two episodes, but otherwise I, I liked it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So anyway, um, we say all that, we say all that, um, because I've been instead watching a show that doesn't fall into that trap, a show that actually gets more and more interesting every episode. Um, and that is Neon Genesis Evangelion watching it for the first time. And it sort of, It touches on some themes that have kind of been in my life somewhat recently. Um, Not necessarily are integral. Uh, I could say they're integral because every moment that happens is integral to your life. Because your life only lasts so long. Um, Angels. I've been... uh, Just last night I was looking up, um, you know, illustrations of biblically accurate angels terrifying and they're fucking terrifying and i actually found a little article that i read to emily last night and uh do you mind if i read it again you can read it um audio people i will try to describe this stuff um but for video people i will add these images to the video so um (laughs) turns out so 
before we get into it, when you think of like an angel, like Christ, Christian angels, how do you imagine them in your mind's eye visually? Essentially, they look like Fabio. They've got like long, flowy hair. <laughs> Fabio? Yeah, they got long, flowy hair. Birds are running into their faces and exploding no, on us. No, <laughs> roller not coaster. roller coaster Fabio, no. <laughs> Just like, you know, really pretty long hair, like wavy. It has some like cute little wings. Mm-hmm. Um, just looks nice. Has kind eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Or it's cute and little. Yeah. I imagine white, like Caucasian, European Caucasian men and women wearing white robes who have a halo and, um, yeah, big white feathered wings on their backs. Mm-hmm. And uh, maybe some sandals, maybe just barefoot, and like a little rope tied around the waist. Yeah. And maybe playing a trumpet, right? Yeah, sure. Well, it turns out angels, as they are described in the Bible, the holy, uh, the the holy Christian Bible, are fucking terrifying, weirdo. Five dimensional being monstrosities. Aliens, and this is all based on like our relationship with aliens. I think it is. Yeah, probably. I think, uh, are, are you talking about for Evangelion or mm-hmm. just angels? Just all both. of the above? Yeah. I do think, um, because the way a lot of the angels and other celestial, uh, religious beings and experiences, uh, you know, Christianity, its myth is composed of uh, so many other p- older pagan myths. Yeah. Uh, Constantine used that to bring more people in from the lands they would conquer. That makes sense. And they would bring them into the Christian church because Rome, by this time, was a Christian empire. Yeah. It was the uh, Roman Catholic church. And Catholic would be universal. Mm-hmm. So it's the church that brings everyone in into the umbrella of their control. Yep. Religion is, was, and shall be, uh, it, it, at least in the sense of Roman Catholicism and so many other religions, um, a, a governmental hegemonic entity. Yeah. Govern, spy, and control. You control thoughts, beliefs, Behavior, outcomes, hopefully. Was that a black, uh, oh man, Black Mirror episode? What? Essentially, okay, so like there were police and the police were after this woman. They were interrogating her. Was it the voting, upvote, downvote episode? No, it was the, I don't think you watched it with me. I think I watched it by myself. But like there's a person, and I'm going to miss it up. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, take, never mind. Never if it comes back out. to you, let me know. I will. Um, anyway, yeah. Angels, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, religion is used for control, but the weird thing is that it is also rooted in some actual stuff that we don't fully understand. Yeah. Um, and one of those things is like angels or or um, their analogs, their older analogs in other religions and tribes, tribal yeah. myths. And I think it's part of aliens. I mean, that's the whole thing with ancient aliens. It definitely could be aliens. Ancient aliens. Yeah, the angels and stuff and all this other. The greys, all of them. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. aliens. But they're different aliens or someone catching a glimpse of the fifth dimension. Because fourth dimension is time. Yeah. And if you're in the fourth dimension, you just are time. But you have to be in the fifth dimension to... Uh, you know, the idea of experiencing all time all at once. Yeah. You have to be a fifth dimensional being to get that. Because, you know, we're third dimensional beings and being in the third dimension allows us to perceive 2D yeah. separately. Um, so 2D for a fifth dimensional being would be time, the fourth dimension. Okay. Easy stuff. Easy stuff to get. And it's kind of what e- Evangelion is partially about. But anyway, let's let's read <laughs> let's read this article. God, I love Evangelion. I just love stuff that really gets into uh, a lot of like Buddhist type thought of 
identity and just reality and different dimensions and stuff humans cannot really comprehend, things that we may view as dangerous, devious, possibly evil. All right, <laughs> let's, let's read this. Um, this is at historyofyesterday.com. The title is How Angels Really Look Like According to the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that bugs me so much. I just feel like it should say how angels really look according to the Bible. I don't know why the like is there. It just is not working for me. It, it really it really doesn't. It was written by Ben Kageyama. I don't know. Maybe English is the second language. Maybe. Maybe. And the subtitle is Heaven Might Be More Bizarre Than Blissful. Okay. Let's see here. <clears throat> Ooh, excuse me. All right, here we go. When people think of angels, they mostly picture a majestic, human-like, winged being. Cherubs, which are a type of angel also mentioned in the Bible, have been reimagined to fit the image of Cupid, cute babies with tiny wings. However, these conceptualizations aren't entirely accurate. Angels, according to the holy text, are a bit more bizarre. According to the Bible, there are different types of angels which surround God. May how, how, how would you say that? Maimonides? I'd say Maimonides. Maimonides, a Jewish... Maimonides? Maimonides, who knows, is a Jewish scholar from the 12th century. Uh, he ranked these beings in terms of port importance in the hierarchy of heaven. What arises is a description of four beings from that hierarchy that have been explained in detail in scripture and the historical circumstances around their conceptualization. So first we have the cherubim. Uh, and here's a little image here. Cherubim of glory. This little illustration by Julius Bates uh, made in 1773. The cherubim, later shortened to cherub, is the lowest in rank among the four. The Bible describes these beings as animal-human hybrids tasked with guarding the Garden of Eden against humankind. Wait, so they didn't want humans in the Garden of Eden? How were they? Makes Wait, sense. I thought that they were the first people. Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve, yeah. But so they're the, keeping people out who? I don't know, man. Okay. I don't know. I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty confused about that because if they're the first two people and no one existed, like Eve was alone and then they broke the rib to give her Adam, mm. who, who are they trying to keep up? It was the other way around. Oh, okay. Adam and gave his rib for was Eve. first and then, yeah, God took his rib and from there is Eve. I was close. Yeah. But yeah, like it just makes no sense to me. Yeah, and then cherubs are guarding uh, the garden against, against humans. humans. But there's two humans, like, running muck, and, like, if they're the only ones, how much damage can they honestly do? Well, it's a mystery, and that is part of our faith, is accepting mysteries. Okay. <laughs> okay. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet's vision depicts them as having four faces. Jesus Christ, one mm -hmm. being four faces. This sounds a lot different than the Cupid-like being. Um, that of a lion, an ox, an eagle, and a human. They have straight legs, four wings, and bull hooves for feet that gleam like polished brass. One set of wings covers their body, and the other is used for flight. This description is far from how we imagine the cherub now. While scholars credit its modern-day image to Greek and Roman deities like um, Cupid, they attribute the detail in the Bible to cultural exchanges with ancient Babylonia, Syria, and Egypt. The cherub's function of guarding sacred places and their mixed appearance is similar to that of the Babylonian Lamassu, Egyptian Sphinx, and Hittite Griffin. I wonder if it's somehow related to skinwalkers. 
Maybe. Shifting into different forms and animals and maybe having this human thing um, embodying all at once these different sorts of creatures. It sounds to me like maybe that is using just an image expressing the concept of a shapeshifter. Yeah, I can see that. And are shapeshifters in uh, uh, flesh walkers and in uh, Native American myths, are they guardians? Maybe. But then they're scared of them, too, so I don't know. They are terrified of Meanwhile, flesh we got, gates. Meanwhile, we have angels that are, like, terrifying, and people love to pretend that they're okay. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. A cherub is as much a Cupid-looking thing as Jesus is a blonde white man. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Okay. Here... We have uh, the Malachim with a painting here that just looks like a person, looks like a human, uh, from a painting by Just stand there, hand- Guido Reni um, from 1636. Is it standing on a goat's horns? Uh, it's standing on a man's head. Okay, I thought I saw horns. It is standing on a man's head, and there are no horns. He's just balding. Okay. Okay. The term angel comes from the Greek word angelos, which originated from the Hebrew word for messenger, malach. The malachim are messengers of God and are the closest looking to us humans. They are third in rank among the four. In the Old Testament, they acted on God's behalf, as did the angel of death in the Passover story, or Michael, the archangel who protects heaven. In the New Testament, they often acted as messengers, like Gabriel, who told Mary, and look how they spelled Mary. It's got two Mary R's, as in, as in getting wed, yeah. yeah, with a capital M, um, like Gabriel, uh, who told Mary of her immaculate conception. These named angels are often the ones people think of when asked to imagine one. However, while the Malachim look like human beings, there was no mention of them having wings in the Bible, Mm. which again is an artistic license thing just gone too far. Yeah. They would add wings to give the concept of, oh, these these creatures could fly up to the heavens. So they were connecting with the heavens. Yeah. And could travel between the earth and the heaven. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, while uh, while the Malachim looked like human beings, there was no mention of them having wings in the Bible. The earliest known Christian image of an angel from the mid-3rd century was without wings. It wasn't until the late 4th century that artists reimagined angels with the possession of wings. According to some researchers, this was done to represent their sublime nature, despite artists knowing that scripture did not describe them as having wings. Yeah, well. So it was an expressionist Mm -hmm. choice. Yeah, they were like, look, all right, we need to convey what they do. Right. These these motherfuckers flying. (laughs) And now we come to the seraphim. Mm -hmm. This image, I don't even know how this is like. Okay, so imagine you have two chickens, like just the chicken breast. Maybe. Uh, this is like four chickens. I'm saying two chickens because it looks like chicken, chicken, and uh-huh. then wing, wing. Yeah. So there are two things that look like chickens with their legs crossed, like crisscrossed. Then there's this weird spiky looking caterpillar in the middle with little tiny feathered looking details to the right and left. I, I can see how you would see that, but that's totally not the intent. This is a ball of feathered wings with a human face sticking out of the center of the mass. So the wings are just covering whatever body it has. But it's head. But it's head because the wings are crossing together at the tips. Okay. See? Boom. The wings. Those are wings. Two wings up top, two wings at the bottom covering the body, and then two more wings on the back out to the sides it uses for flight. It's a sentient chicken. Uh, Okay. This was from um, Theophanes the Greek from 1378, that image. 
So according to the prophet Isaiah, the seraphim is an angelic being that surrounds the throne of God, singing, holy, 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 in unison to God's approach. The prophet describes them as having six wings, two of which are for flying, while they use the rest to cover their heads and feet. Seraphim are the second highest in rank, according to Mammonides, uh, angelic hierarchy. One may trace the historical influences for the seraphim from its name. Seraphim derives from the Hebrew word seraph, which, which means to burn in English. Digging deeper, the Hebrew word seraph means venomous desert snake. In ancient Egypt, people referred to the cobra as the flaming one. This icon was called Uraeus and it usually adorned the pharaoh's headpiece like the cobra coming out of the third eye That's which is cool. like in yoga too mm -hmm. uh, especially kundalini yoga which is like an ancient version of yoga yeah um, several historians speculate that uh, the authors of the Old Testament derived seraphim's wings and flames from Egyptian imagery and associations with the cobra. Interesting. Why would they do that? For a thing that guards the throne? Because they're dangerous and they can bite, keep from attack or something? Yeah, I guess. And where's the fire? Like, is this thing like a ball of fire r with a human face sticking out, wrapped in feathered wings? Your guess is as good as mine on that one, but I'm not really sure where they were going with it. You know, like... Mm -hmm. uh, so spit it out. I don't know. It just seems kind of really weird to have something that's like so dangerous and scary and you're like, you know what's great? I'm going to have that. I'm going to try to own it in some sort of way. I'm not sure I get what you're saying. That's who's, fine. who's they? It's fine. We'll okay. just move on. From okay. Um, and then we have the Ophanim. <laughs> this thing is a fucking trip. So we're looking at some some wheels, like some rings with human eyeballs all over it and wings on these wheels and they're all like interlocked kind of like the um olympic rings they do look like the olympic rings maybe that's what it's based on the Probably. olympic rings okay uh let's see the image is ezekiel's wheel in saint john the baptist church in kratovo macedonia uh, this was painted in 1836 all right the ophanim or the wheels, as are translated, is arguably the most bizarre being in the Bible. Ezekiel's account in the Bible describes them as beings made out of interlocking gold wheels, each with each wheel's exterior covered with multiple eyes. They move by floating themselves in the sky. Weird sentence, all right. At, as the highest in the uh, hierarchy, they are tasked with guarding God's throne. There is no exact historical origin for the Onafim. Joseph F. Blumchik, a former NASA employee, theorized that Ezekiel's vision of the wheels and other angels might have been a UFO sighting. Mm -hmm. However, Critics label him as a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> that, I mean, that you're getting called out in an article. Flat out. Like, hey, this one guy says that it may be a UFO, but he's a conspiracy we theorist. We all think he's a quack. Yeah. We don't trust that. But the thing is, I think a lot of this shit is UFO stuff. Yeah. Why wouldn't there be? Yeah. And again, I swear I must have talked about it on the show at some point in this 10 years thus far. I think there's shit all around us that it's just on a different frequency that our radios can't pick up, so yeah, to speak. that makes sense. Fifth dimensional beings. How the fuck third dimensional beings cannot catch fifth dimensional being? No. Mm, necessarily, but I think there are ways that maybe you can expand and adjust your frequency. To be able to pick up on other frequencies? Do not know, but probably. It sounds crazy to some, but I think it makes perfect sense. 
And I think if you asked anyone who gets into like weird physics and math and that kind of shit, they would probably say the same thing. Yeah. Because a lot of the theoretical stuff, be it used by quacks or um, non-quacks who say, well, this is an odd thing we don't understand yet. It often comes down to basically the frequency of your your energy. You know, how is it moving? Yeah. The vibrations, because everything is vibrating as a sound. And that's like with the Bible, like uh, the word of God. It yeah. spoke and being came to an existence. You know, everything is sound. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I want to read that again. There is no exact historical origin for the Ophanum. Joseph F. Bonrich, a former NASA employee, theorized that Ezekiel's vision of the wheels and other angels might have been a UFO sighting. However, critics label him as a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Nevertheless, other authors claim that an ingested psychedelic substance caused the prophet's vision. Scholars have also proposed the idea that the image was merely a metaphor for God's mystery. Yeah, I guess. I told you last night when I first read this that I think um, psychedelics play such a huge influence in this, whether they intentionally took it or not. Maybe yeah. they just ate a fermented berry or something. Yeah, they were like, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat but, this random thing. But it's like all this weird shit we get in older myths. Yeah. It's a combination of psychedelics and ancient brain. It's true. You know, like where they thought rats grew out of corpses. Yeah. Or mice out of hay. <laughs> mice out of hay. Mm-hmm. Or babies coming from storks. Come on. I wish. Come on. Or, you know, people that believed that rabbits laid eggs. Yeah, those people are stupid as shit. I'm not one of them. So, final thoughts. It's interesting to take a step back and observe the conception of these beings from a secular standpoint. Creature, uh, centuries of culture, geography, and history have shaped what we have collectively forgotten and reimagined as angels. The otherworldly nature of these beings is also of note uh, to believers in Christian and Jewish scriptura. They are worthy. They'll spend, uh, if they are worthy, they'll be spending an eternity in heaven with God alongside these bizarre creatures. It was a good ending. Yeah, that was a good ending, but I never want to see those creatures in, in my life. I do. Yeah, you can. I'm like, mm -mm, I don't want to see that. I'm into that tripped out shit. Like, I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, you know, psycho not. I want to check out these other dimensions. I do not. I want to commune with the aliens, man. You would. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Uh, and about 48 minutes here. I wanted to do a little bit shorter episodes. for So um, uh, that's that's all I really had to talk about for this episode. Yeah. We talked about acting, boring directors. There are so many fucking boring directors. <laughs> TV shows that we've watched lately. TV shows we've watched lately. And there's some weird shit about angels. And I, I do want to explore and see because I suspect these weird depictions of angels is one of the central things of neon, neon Genesis Evangelion. Yeah. Because these creatures that are supposedly threatening humanity, they're calling them angels. And at the very beginning, I pointed it out to you earlier this morning, and like in the intro scene and montage, it shows images of these weird, biblically accurate angels yeah uh and also like the map of like the tree of cabal and all this stuff yeah uh, yeah it gets into some weird tripped out stuff man and yeah i want to figure out just how on point i am with what i suspect the show's about yeah so uh if you want to catch that and maybe some tips i found i found some other stuff about how to keep pineapples good for longer <laughs> <laughs> just to fill time <laughs> you don't like it you just sit on this butterfinger but if you like it uh, become a patron at patreon.com slash that thing with james stick around for the bonus episode and see if i really understand what the fuck evangelion is about a thing that is notoriously difficult for people to understand but i'm superior to all of them because my brains is good so i probably get it already i'm not good you can see if i'm right or wrong 
patreon.com slash that thing with James. Uh, and uh, thank you for tuning in. I will catch you not next week because we won't be recording, but the week after. We'll catch you then. Bye. Bye.